ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the White Horse stage, and especially to the Red Chair, Mr. Lawrence McCall. Thank you. Lawrence, you're very welcome. I'm not a dub. No, you're not a dub. So straight away they're going, listen, this boy can't, it can't be too bad. Um, all, all dubs are, we're all God's children, as John Creedon used to say one time. Tell us about the Happy Startup School. What is the Happy Startup School about? That's a good question. Um, so the Happy Startup School is more than anything, it's a community of people, I think. Um, so we've been going almost three years now. And when we first started out, we, we were really challenged, trying to challenge convention, like you said. And I think over time, as we built up a, um, a bit of movement, I suppose a bit of support, um, we've actually built a community of people who are trying to challenge convention. So I think more than anything, we're a community, but aligned to that, we're also a business school. And so the learning part is helping people to challenge convention through the way they do business. So looking at different measures of success and we do all sorts of things from events, programs, and online courses to help people to you know, go from A to B, and that can be different depending on which stage you're at. But sure. But behind it, there appears to be a philosophy, if I could describe it as that. So how, how would you describe that? In four words, happy is the new rich. Okay. Um, that's the tagline we use. Um, I think more than anything, it's like I said, looking at success in different ways. And I think if you look at the way business traditionally works, there's the graph that goes upwards to the yep. right. Yep, yep. Hockey stick growth, um, which is great if that's the kind of business you want to build, but mm. not everyone does. And mm. what we're seeing a lot in our community and elsewhere in the world is that, you know, that measure of success doesn't work for everyone. So I think if you can look when you're starting out, and I think um, Colin touched a bit on this in terms of the vision as well, looking ahead to see what success looks like, how can you build your business and life in a way that actually supports that rather than grates against it? And I think um, if you look at convention, convention tells you you should do business this way. You should grow and keep growing, and that's the right way to do things. Um, but often that comes at the cost of other stuff. And if that's not the business you want to build, then what happens to the rest, the personal life, the relationships, the um, the stuff around it, you know, yeah. which is the the... The, I think someone's called it the dirt and the dust, you know, that yeah. stuff. So unless you're prepared for that, then that can be a, a slippery slope. Yeah. And I guess the thing that fascinates me most about you and your, your journey with this is of all the things that you could have done, why do you find, or why do you believe hmm. that you find yourself now on this mission with Carlos, your co-founder and others? Um, why, why you? Why are you doing this, do you think? Um, I think it's an evolution. I think um, people rarely for, sort of you know, plan out this stuff. And for me, I mean, we're, we're trying to explore, can we help people at a younger stage in their careers? So the millennials, someone talked about um, earlier. But I really think there is something in failing and making mistakes along the way. So for mm. me personally, my journey was working in lots of different companies very early on as a freelancer. So I studied economics at university. Um, lasted about 10 months in the city of London, hated every minute. Um, for me, it w didn't, just didn't work. Yeah, and it wasn't you. For me, that um, experience I had early on was just the most horrendous company culture okay. that I could possibly experience. And I looked at that as a blessing because mm. I didn't, didn't enjoy that. And if it was okay, maybe I'd still be there. You know? yeah. So I don't think that I was gifted this uh, mission that we're on now. I just think it was a series of uh, life experiences and events and um, yeah just questioning a lot of why people did things and I think when I look back at my early career which was um, as a, a train or well, trained myself to be a designer after that failed uh, city career it was really working with lots of different companies seeing how they worked seeing how people ran companies how they treated people and I really learned a lot from that just seeing how things could be done differently and actually learning from people who did it wrong in my opinion yeah. And then they were the people I learned from more than people who seemed to do it well. Yeah, time. yeah, yeah. That makes sense. And tell us, though, of the... Because, you know, you touched on it. You, you've, from working with people in, in the startup world and, and other businesses for a decade or so, and all the lessons that you, you took from that, at what point did you and Carlos and others kind of go, you know what, there is a better way of doing this. Let's do something about it, mm -hmm. so to speak. 
can you remember the, the, those initial conversations around? Um, so me and Carlos ran an agency for, um, well, 10 years in total, but about seven or eight years by the time we started off with the idea of the Happy Startup School. So we'd always been interested, even from day one when we first started out, just two of us, at companies that did things differently. So they weren't companies in our field, so we were in the web industry. So we looked to, um, there was a book called, I can't remember the name of it, but the company was called St. Luke's, an agency in London, and um, they were one of the first companies that we saw that were trying to challenge convention, and uh, they had quite a quirky office. They really immersed their customers in, in the experience of creating products at the time and campaigns. And so we just used to read up on interesting companies, um, Basecamp, um, a software tool, in the US, again, who we blogged about what they did. So mm. I think it's like Colin was saying, being visible, you know, yeah. being out there. Yeah. And for us, we just absorbed all this stuff about other companies that did things differently. And we would always just bounce off each other with ideas and then go to events like this and just, yeah, just curious, I think. Curiosity yeah. is one of our early strengths, I guess. Yeah. That's an interesting word because as observers in any business, right, you're, you're only as, um, your ability to change is a direct function of your ability to observe. Mm -hmm. So would you put that down as one of your superpowers to use that construct or? Uh, or I think we've got better at it. I mean, we talk a lot about mindset, you know, yeah. so having a growth mindset or an entrepreneurial mindset when you're starting out. And I think a lot of people, if they've come from a different world, you know, if they've come from the corporate world or, you know, even the education system to some extent, yeah. you're trying to shift how you think about things. And yeah. so, if you're looking for the answers, um, you know, looking for the silver bullet, put it that way, then it's going to be hard. Whereas if you just keep learning and picking things up along the way, then I think mm -hmm. that's really important. So I just think you never stop learning running a business. You know, yeah. you never, you can never think you know it all because yeah. it's down to your experience and your context and your bias. And so, yeah, I think it's just being like a child, you know, just having that curiosity. So yeah. I think that's a good strength regardless of who you are. For sure. Um, give us a sense though of, you know, the, you have the happy startup school and you have a philosophy behind it. And we talked already about the, the vision thing. Give us a sense of where it can go or where, you know, what's the, the mission even to use yeah. that phrase? Well, give us a, a sense of what that is. Um, I mean, for us, it's exciting to think what we can build because I think it's such a powerful message. You know, it's not for everyone. So I think that's one thing that we're comfortable with is it's a, to some extent a Marmite mm. business, yeah, yeah. Um, which I think is a good thing because I think that means that there's people who love us and there's people who hate us and that's okay, fine. Okay, so let, let's unpick that a bit. Who would be the people that you're finding are arriving into your orbit, you know, that are calling you up or, you know, signing up for your stuff? Describe your typical... Typical customer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, you know, who's... who's Who's so who's a lover, not yeah, the hater? Yeah, precisely. Who's <laughs> we'll do the other one in a minute. Yeah, yeah, um, we will. <laughs> um, I would say it's typically someone who's looking for a bit more. So you okay. talked a bit about meaning earlier on. Yeah. I would say, I wouldn't say it's an age thing. I think there is, you know, a point in life when you start to look at things and think, I want something more. So you might yeah. have just had kids or something's made you reassess what you're doing. But I definitely think that search for meaning is is you know, a key part of anyone who comes to our events or wants to be part of it. Because you can get startup advice from anywhere, you can yeah. get um, inspiration from anywhere, you can see speakers in any event, you know. Yeah. So there's a, an ethos that we have, which I think is really about finding something more than just a paycheck. And so sure. I would say that's the common thread. And within that, it could be, like I said, someone who's making that shift from a more safe, secure working environment to something a bit more unstable, like running yeah. a business. Yeah. And God actually, if some people come, yeah, yeah. some people, although they're with a happy startup school, a lot of people yeah. come to us and end up not starting a business. Right, you know? yeah, I was going to say that. Um, so, for example, one girl came to our summer camp last year and she sent us a letter recently and she, uh, she hadn't started a business then, but her goal was to come and learn about startups and yeah. absorb herself in this world. And she liked what we were doing. And she ended up chatting to um, Sanderson Jones, actually, who started the Sunday Assembly, which... So he's the host of our event, and okay. she was chatting to him in the coffee queue in the morning or something at seven in the morning, yeah. hungover probably. And, seven uh, in the morning? Well, whatever time it was. We're going to talk about your events in a way. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. They've gone to bed, I think. All right. Not okay. together. All right. <laughs> as far as I know. At the White Horse. Um, and 
she ended up chatting to him. And anyway, to cut a long story short, you know, six months later, she's CTO of, um, or COO of uh, Sunday Assembly. So she's now managing their operations yeah, around okay. the world and how they grow mm. their movement. Um, completely, you know, a bleak um, meeting, completely yeah, yeah. left field way of mm. um, changing her career, but she's way happier as a result. Pick up in Collins when she was out there. She, she was, was out there. searching exactly. for something not sure Coffee why at it the time. Was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, at least it's one thing. And then the, the other side of the coin, the, the ambivalence, I, know, I was, I, I was going to say ambivalence, but they're not. Yeah. The haters, the people that go, oh, that's so annoying, those happy, clappy startup guys, I wish they'd just piss off. I mean, have you... It wasn't you, was it? No, it wasn't. Really. <laughs> Sounds a bit too... Uh... No, I had a lot of passion in that one. I, I've been watching a lot of TV. No, it's that, you know, have you in, in, encountered resistance at events or, you know, people giving you that kind of, would you ever hmm. go away? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> generally not at our events because hopefully yeah. they self-select yes. before they come. Yes. But Did you get any here tonight? I just need to know this before. Not yet, but I'm, okay, I'm hoping not yet. Some, We haven't yeah. done the q and okay. a... That's right. That's okay. Yeah. You've, you've told me about my exit if I need to. That's right. We have two. Um, I think a lot of it's people who don't really who haven't experienced what we've done, mm -hmm. you know, from the inside. So, you know, I look at it as uh, feedback, you know, yeah. because to me it's, we've not communicated ourselves well enough. Mm -hmm. um, there's some people who just love a debate or love an argument and that's right. fine. Um, we know a few developers like that, so I've employed a few of them. Yeah. Um, uh, but I see it, like I said, I see it as, you know, I'm not saying we need to appeal to everyone, but there's a universal truth in, I think, in what we're doing that most people can kind of um, agree with. Yeah. It might be that some of the messaging or some of the branding or some of the um, the tone of it just grates with people a little bit. And I can see that, you know, mm. that's, that's fine. Mm. Um, we've had a couple of runners with people who seem to think that we were trying to get people to just do what they love and follow their passion. And, you know, there's this kind of um, happiness at the end of the rainbow type yeah. thing. Yeah. And I think that for me is damaging, you know, yeah. and I can see why they yeah. think that. That's the reason. But yeah. all I'll say to them is just come to one of our events, you know, come mm -hmm. to summer camp, come to Altitude. Um, come on our course and just if you don't like it then that's cool you know yeah. I'm cool with that but to judge it from the outside I think is like that, anything that's not an uncommon mindset I mean you will have people that that will have told themselves convinced themselves in some way that work and generating income and all these things are a form of torture a <laughs> form of thing you must do and that the concept of happiness is something that exists outside of that domain. I mean, a lot of people walk yeah. around telling themselves that story. So, um, yeah, what was your... My dad, what, for example. Okay, <laughs> tell us more about him. Um, no, I think the older generation generally, this is a real kind of broad stroke generalization, but I think, you know, 20, 30 years ago, work was work. You know, mm. to be in a position where work was fun and enjoyable um, was just... An alien concept to a lot of people yeah. so i think you know my generation and certainly the next generation are now expecting a lot more i think uh, we touched on earlier so um yeah i think there's people who are just in that mindset and they can't ever get out of it and partly that's the story they've told themselves right yeah. so i think if you're in that position and i've got relatives like that too who they just put work in that box and they get their pleasure from their pastimes or mm -hmm. their family or the other stuff and that's cool you know mm -hmm. we can't I'm not in a position to try and preach or yeah. say they're wrong, but yeah. for me personally and for a lot of people we work with, that's not enough, you know. Yeah. And I think what we're trying to educate people about is that you can actually get a lot of pleasure and meaning from work. It can be fun, it can be hard too, and it can be even harder if you're running your own business. But I think it can also be something beneficial to society too. So by you yeah. doing something that you believe in, hopefully other people uh, warm to that. I think Colin touched on it when he said, you know, you put yourself out there, but he was being true to his own values. And I think yeah. that's one of the things we are about is everything we do is us, you know, it's authentic. That's why if you don't like it, fine, but yeah. it's not us trying to be something we're not. Yeah. The, I suppose the, the thing that occurs to me as you say that is the fact that when we, you know, I was going to use the concept of fun, which a lot of people have a resistance to the word fun. Yeah. It's like, oh, holy shit, is this one of these kind of wearing <laughs> different colored t-shirts and team building and getting on the bus and all this kind of stuff. Um, but there, there is a lot of research which you guys have um, developed mm. and, you know, and share and package and so on in and around outcomes within the working context mm -hmm. are better with higher levels of engagement when people have that 
yeah. greater meaning and happiness and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So like from all, all the, the research that you've uh, observed and shared and so on, what things kind of stick out for you? Um, I think it comes back, I, mean, I talked about curiosity earlier. Yeah. For me, it's that childlike you know, yeah. wonder. You know, I've got two young kids myself and they're just started in the school system and you can already see some of that creativity getting sucked out of them, which kind of depresses me a little bit. Um, and I don't know what the answer is. Well, there's, we could talk all night about the education yeah. system, yeah, but yeah, yeah. for me, play is so important to that. And yeah. I think, you know, seeing my kids playing le Lego or just um, exploring and learning through playing and not having this structure and rules you talked about earlier, um, for me, is where innovation happens. You know, yeah. we have Lego workshops in some of our events, or we have people, you know, um, hiking in the mountains, whatever it might be, mm. something that feels like it shouldn't be work and it's not work, yeah, yeah. but actually the business value from it is way out, uh, for, from our um, research and, and observations is way out, um, supersede anything that they've done in a different context, there you go. even though it feels like it shouldn't be fun. So if you're trying to get your boss to write off or to you know, sign off a check for an event like that, you're like, well, it just looks like a bunch of people having holiday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why should I do that? Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. the outcomes of what they come yes. away with is, um, you know, new learnings, a new perspective on what they're doing, thinking of learning in a different way, thinking of business in a different way, and great friendships too as a result of having a shared experience around something which seems a bit bizarre and having to regress back to what we were maybe sort of when we were kids. So yeah, yeah. I think it's that, yeah, I talked about mindset, that shift. That G give me a sense from your own experience now though of let's say when you uh, were in university or when you started at that job in the city, what has changed in the intervening years that actually allow people to engage um, along these lines or explore work or explore careers, explore the opportunities to build businesses? What's changed? Is it all about the internet? Is it all about technology? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, how much of that is cultural? How much of that is technical? Or what do you think? I think it's all of those things, really. I think um, the internet is obviously a massive part of it. Um, but I think more and more technology is not about, you know, computers, it's about, mm. it's all around us, it's, yeah. you know, mobile devices, it's frictionless technology, you know, yeah. you know it's, it's, it's everywhere. So I think, yeah, it's created a level playing field, and I yeah. think that's one thing that has become more about, apparent. Uh, technology has become more playful too, so it doesn't yeah. feel like it used to, you know, it feels like it's part of our lives. Um, but I think culturally too, I think people, you know, want more people are looking at different ways of living. You know, they're not just all fixed to one abode now. Yeah. You've got digital nomads, I hate the expression. If anyone's not heard it, then yeah. feel free to yeah, never yeah. say it again. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But the idea of being able to live anywhere and, and yeah. work from a laptop is something yeah. that was just alien 15 years ago. For sure. And now just seems like, yeah, why not? So yeah, um, so yeah I think the cultural piece, I think the technology piece, and I think actually, what we're doing and we're seeing other people do is the community piece too. So not wanting to feel isolated and technology can make you feel isolated too. And I think more and more, you know, this age of technology is about communities. It's not yes. about me and the computer. It's about us connecting through the computer. Yeah. And so you're seeing more and more niche communities of people, um, you know, whether it's down to a sports club, but you know, on a higher level communities of purpose, you know, yes. and, that's exciting because I think it's getting us back to what we're really here to do, which is just to connect in places like this and hang Brilliant. out together. Communities of purpose is a great phrase, uh, Lawrence. I have to say, when I heard of you guys first, when, when I looked through your stuff, and it's all, you, know, you always package it and design it beautifully, one of your advantages of coming from <laughs> the design thing was that if Seth Godin was rewriting his book, Tribes, he'd have a chapter or hit a segment as he has about you guys because mm. you seem to um, just personify a lot of the, what he was talking about do you see the, the happy startup community as that that tribe mm -hmm. and if so what are they gathering around Ooh, good question um, I, I think it is I mean people come to our events and they feel you know that feeling when they leave is mm -hmm. like I feel like these are my people in inverted commas. Okay. And, that, and that can sound very culty and look very culty from the outside. So I'm very conscious of that yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. And, There's know, no secret oaths or um, no, signing on things um, or Kool-Aid or anything. So we had this guy speak at our summer camp last year, Christian Stadio, who's like, um, he's on the Dragon's Den version, uh, sorry, Danish version of Dragon's Den. So okay. he's like a billionaire serial entrepreneur, but he wrote a book called Company Karma. So okay. he talks a lot about how he's built his businesses with the right intentions. And, 
So he came to summer camp and he's like, oh, it's just going to be a bunch of crazy hippies in the field. <laughs> yeah. And he was describing to his assistant what it was going to be like before he got there. And they went down the path and he said, there's going to be a guy there and he looks going to look like Jesus and I'm going to get there. And they'll all be dancing in this barn. And they got there and that's exactly what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> but it was okay. It was good. <laughs> So did you have to like lock the door and keep him in? Did he? <laughs> did you hear from him? We couldn't get there? rid of him. Oh really? No, literally, he, literally he was. Um, he had to go back to uh, to wherever it was, Denmark, the next day, and uh, yeah, he loved it. He had a great time. So I think, you know, there is a bit of ceremony, but yeah. it's not. Um, we try not to be too sort of happy clappy about it. It's really just a celebration, you know, summer, yeah, camp, yeah, yeah. summer camp in particular. That's fair. Enough. And I think, um, you know, it's one of the things we try and highlight that you said is business can be fun. Yes. And you know. Um, it was touched on earlier, you know, the people you meet, the, the opportunities you see, you know, if you can build those relationships in a way that doesn't feel like it's work or doesn't feel like networking, then why not? You know, we're all just people at the end of the day. We're not, Correct. We're not business people. Yes, that's, that's bang on. You used the phrase earlier, a business school. So the Happy Startup School is a business school. What does it teach? What does it teach? Um, Business, but different. <laughs> and, you know, we, we teach about life. So, I mean, this is School of Life. You, mm -hmm. I don't know if you get it in Ireland, but um, Alain de Bouton started the School of Life, which is much more about you know, how to be the best person you can be, how to explore mm -hmm. about relationships, love, and all that stuff. So I think startups and business for us is, is like a hook, yeah. right? So there's organizations um, like Action for Happiness who... Um, do happiness courses, but I think for us, you know, business is a platform for doing good. Business is a platform for living the life you want to live. Yeah. And um, some people come out of that thinking, okay, great, I've learned about myself, but I don't want to build a business, and that's okay. cool. Yeah, yeah. But they've learned something. Yes. Um, maybe it wasn't what they came to learn, but okay. actually, it's way more valuable than the stuff that they thought they needed to True. learn. So, so that's quite, you know, what we found is really intriguing for us and for them. And so, yeah, I'd say it's a conduit, really. It's a way for people to explore not just what they're building, but also who they are. And yeah. part of the reason for that is, I think when we were working with clients, um, when we ran the agency, people would come to us with an idea for a business without really having thought about why they were doing it. You know, they would say, um, I want to build this dating app and it's got these features. And so we were designing and building the product. They'd have a clear idea of what the brief was. They'd, they'd had it all planned out from year one to three, pocket okay. stick growth, yeah. you know, happy yeah, customers, yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. And we knew from building stuff that, it's, A, it's not that simple if you're building products. Yep. It doesn't work from A to B. There's always a plan C that probably would work better. Um, but also, why them? Like you said earlier to mm. me, why them? You know, yeah. why are you building this idea? Yeah. Because we knew that actually, if you're not committed to that idea, chances are it won't, um, well, you won't stick around for the yes. long term. And so we just started to, you know, get curious with people like, you know, what's the story? You know, if, for me designing the product, for me telling the story of the business, building the brand, the bit they hadn't really thought about. Um, you know, we're doing a workshop tomorrow at the mm. UCC about this stuff, you know, mm. storytelling. People don't think about that stuff and they yeah. think, oh, why has my personal story got anything to do with this? Yeah. Um, but it's got everything to do with it. You yeah. know, that is the reason that yes. they're doing it. So why them? And so I think for me, you know, this personal business um, sort of mix is, is so important because otherwise we're just a bunch of robots going around yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, building yeah. businesses without any... Slaves sort of, to the business. Exactly. So yeah. once you start to dig deeper, you'll find out, okay, yeah, well, actually I had this episode like, you know, Colin was talking about on the train or some yeah. little gleaming detail that you're like, yeah. wow, that's really interesting, you know, yeah, yeah. and that's the source of the idea which has created this idea and that gets me excited. Sure. And so, and then you get the fire going in them. Yeah and you know why they're doing it and what's driving it. If you don't get that gleaming moment, then chances are that they're not gonna stick around. So, yeah. um, and often there can be some, you know, some story which they're not comfortable telling, and I think our events and uh, programs help people to kind of get those out and feel comfortable sharing them. Yes, yes, which is a good service. Um, the practical side of starting a concept like the Happy Startup School and building a global awareness of the the concept and the brand itself and how people interact mm. with it give us a sense of how, how that's evolved just you know because a lot of people i guess are, are either watching or here tonight are, are in um, the business of trying to mm -hmm. you know build a, a global brand or a brand that can scale but so give us some of the let's say the the highlights of that journey from idea to yeah. where you are today with 
Um, so many people looking at it. Well, I think first off, it wasn't a a global strategy. You know, we okay. didn't sit there planning from our ivory tower, you yep. know, how this was going to play out. I think it was very much just putting out something into the world and, mm -hmm. and seeing what came back. So I think the highlights for me are just always the stories, you know, mm. um, because I think the internet's an amazing thing. You know, you yeah. can reach someone anywhere and not realize it. Yeah. You know, if you've got a product that scales or even a blog post or a book or something. So I think that is empowering and it's exciting. So um, for us, it's just grown organically. You know, it's really been about putting something out there. We haven't sort of strategically, you know, tied in with partners to get our message out there. It's just been really people finding us and they're not sure how they found us or yeah. how that happened. Sometimes they can, but generally it's just it's stumbled in their inbox or they huh. saw a tweet or something for yeah. someone they follow. Um, so I think that's quite a powerful thing for anyone to understand is you can build a business without any awareness about what you're doing. Um, yeah. But unless you share it, you're not going to get found out. So wow, that's a big one. I think one of the things we try and get all our um, founders to do early on is just share their story, you know, just to get on a platform like Medium or, um, um, you know, stand and pitch their idea to five people or just tell their wife or anyone, you know, yeah. just get yeah. anyone to care about what just you're doing. open it up. Um, because otherwise, you know, you're not going to get found out. And yeah. being comfortable that you're going to make mistakes and that you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. There was, um, uh, actually I probably shouldn't swear on camera, but uh, there was a quote, someone said, basically get your SH1T together um, is the thing that you're meant to hear before you get okay. your business out there, which is probably the worst advice because no one knows really what they're doing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's That's probably true. understanding that you get it together when you're working it out. And so telling about that story, which we've done almost, is saying, yeah, we're on this um, journey, you know, join us on this journey. And I think that's what people like is they feel part of it. Absolutely. And mm. I think it, there, there's a, a resonance there for people who have um, maybe spent a lot of their lives kind of feeling bad about not having the answers mm. for it, whether like a teacher or someone in a suit or someone in a bank told yeah. them um, that's not the right answer. Computer says no. Yeah. And um, I think it's, it's refreshing, the, right, in that, that, that sense that, you know, maybe there aren't a, a right answer. Well, there I think particularly right with, um, well, life and business, you know, yeah. the two things that no one's really worked out. Everyone's got, you know, successes and failures, mm -hmm. but ultimately they're driven by, you know, luck, a bit of yeah. a great skill, the right time, you know, there's all sorts of things that can play a part in uh, certainly business success. So, um, yeah, I think it's being vulnerable too. You know, we... When we try and get people to talk at the events, you know, like you've done, sharing your successes and failures, you know, no one's interested in just seeing what went well. You know, they yeah. want to hear about the bad stuff, and yeah. I think that makes people feel reassured that you know not everyone's got the answer, and yeah, you can learn from yeah. real human beings who are exactly. make, making it up as they go along. Yeah. And you know, if someone's standing on a stage in front of a few hundred people, saying, "Look, you know, two years ago I was sat there like you, you know, and I didn't know what I was doing, and now suddenly I'm doing okay." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It makes everyone possible. else feel like, okay, right. next time it will be me up there, yeah. rather than, you know, I'm the superstar business owner and, right. you, know, you know, if you pay me X, then you're going to learn oh, my yeah. secret. You get the, <laughs> exactly the magic formula. Um, so the, as far as I can see, there, there's kind of two ways that people can essentially benefit from the, the happy startup school. One is through the online mm -hmm. medium in different ways. And then the second piece is in person at actual events and so on. So give us a sense of the, the first, the, the online piece and what kind of work that you guys are doing on an ongoing basis with, yeah. with, with people. So we, we actually started off doing events. So I think one of the key things was people wanted to stay connected. So it was almost like a need from the community. It wasn't us. Although we were building online products at the time for our clients, you know, the yeah. easiest thing for us would have been to build an online platform. Okay. But I think we were conscious we just didn't want to be a software company. You know, we'd built software for lots of other clients. We were conscious that we'd end up just fixing bugs for a yeah. living. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think Colin was chatting to earlier, made a great point. He said he loves business but hates work. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was a great line, a, which I'm going to borrow yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Um, a subtle but significant difference. Yes. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it was that, that feeling of, yeah, we've done the, the graph to get here. You know, running an agency is hard work. It's a good education, but it's a really hard way to live your life. Um, we didn't want to do it in the same way. So I think we were always wanting to build products, but only when we knew there was a demand for it because we bought enough ones where there wasn't for a client. Right, right. yeah, <laughs> um, for sure. And both them and us had lost a lot of um, you know, time and brain cells on the way. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think we, we started off doing events and then off the back of summer camp, um, probably two years ago, we 
yeah, people were just saying, look, we, we can't wait another year to, to hang out again. You know, this is crazy. So we started to explore the idea of a membership uh, mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. And we launched our first homeschool, which was, um, yeah, which was basically us trying to find 100 people around the world who are willing to be part of this, you know, cohort of people who want to do business differently. And sure. we kind of set ourselves that benchmark stupidly at the time, but we did and we made it just about. And yeah, again, that was us just putting it out there and seeing yeah, yeah. who's up for, for coming, coming on board. And, you know, that was just amazing for us going from running an agency where we're working with one client at a time, yeah. you know, based on location, i.e. they have to be based in, you know, London, South East, or maybe, you know, Europe, but yeah. certainly close to us, to having people from Vietnam and wow. you know, Uruguay and Monica. all sorts of parts of uh, the world signing up and sharing us their story, you know, yeah. and, and they're all coming together and feeling connected around a common goal, you know, not feeling like these are just a bunch of randoms in a room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but actually, we're just all the same, you know, we're all, yeah. we're all people at the end of the day. And, um, so give us a sense of what uh, people who are part of those <coughs> cohorts, what do they experience? Like what, what is their process as they, they go through the, the happy startup school experience? So with the homeschool in particular, we've got um, what we call the four P's. Okay. So it's passion, purpose, people and profits. Okay. So I think like you talked about earlier, the gravity piece, you know, yes. we're not saying start a business and if you follow your passion, you'll make money, you know, yeah, yeah, profits. Yeah is the fuel, you know, it's, yeah. the, it's the engine. So without that, it's, you know, it's not going to survive, but right. it's not the main thing for us. Yeah. It's the, it's the thing that keeps you alive, but it's yes. not the sole goal in itself. So, yeah. um, so it's kind of a linear process, although, you know, it's a bit artificial to some extent because mm -hmm. it's an online course, but um, we're cool with that because I think, you know, you, you can dip in and out of it any time. So, and the first two weeks are passion and purpose. So the first two weeks are really, um, looking at yourself and your, your idea, you know, just to assess that and rip it apart. And just to start to think about, okay, if I'm going to build a business, although I might have this idea, we know perfectly well that the idea will evolve and maybe you'll bend that idea in the first place. And yeah. I think a lot of the people we work with are, are finding their feet. So almost the first idea doesn't really matter. You know, it's the process of learning how to build a business. Yeah. And so the first couple of weeks are really for them to explore, okay, what am I good at? What are my strengths? What are my passions? And how can I build those into the business? And uh, and what do I need as well? Why am I yeah, doing this? You yeah, know, what, exactly. You know, do I need a business? Do I need the hassle? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's a bit of a filter, really, to okay. say, okay. And and the things that often come back are like, I need more time. I need more autonomy. I need uh, more purpose. You know, yes. money's important, but it's not the main thing. Mm. So once they know those things, they're like, okay, okay, how can I get those things? Um, with what I do and, and is a business the right way to do that and with this girl, you know, the Sunday Assembly um, uh, COO, you know, for her, she's got, you know, those boxes ticked in different yes, ways that's brilliant. So but she was clear about what it is she, that she wanted and, and put herself out there as well Yeah, that's the other thing is, you know, we put ourselves out there, but you got me it's halfway, you know, yes <laughs> no, no, that, that's, that's only that's only fair and then the actual um, the events themselves that's interesting how the online grew from <laughs> Yeah. A residual demand or sequential demand or whatever from the, the events. But give us a sense of the, the stuff you're doing right now because the, um, the schedule looks amazing. I mean, you're literally all over the world in bizarre locations or wonderful locations um, doing yeah. crazy things. So tell us about, about those. So I think it's an example or uh, a case study in serendipity, really. Okay. <laughs> and so my business partner is a, an ex-scientist who, who loves planning. And he just gets terrified about this journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he likes systems and processes okay. and, and, and strategy. And you know, I'm there, kind of going, "Let's do this. This looks yeah, awesome." Yeah, and he's yeah. like, oh, Here we go again. Not again. <laughs> yeah. Just when I thought we had it nailed. Yeah. Um, so, but he's getting quite comfortable with it, and you know, it's good to have that. Um, it's good to have the yin and yang. I think in, in sure. any business partnership. Um, so I think f to start with, summer camp was our first event. So we, we do that over three days. It's the um, best way of describing it is a conference on a farm. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Well, someone called it our AGM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just happens to be on a farm. Okay. It's on a 300 acre, acre site near um, about an hour between London and Brighton. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's an amazing event. It's, it's three days of talks, workshops, activities. It's a festival, really. Yeah. Um, and it just happens to be in a stunning setting. You know, we do kayaking, we have. Last year we had a ukulele workshop and uh, bushcrafting and all that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, those things might seem a bit superficial, a bit mm. um, silly, but to 
I think someone was asking earlier about the more insecure people or the, certainly the more introvert people. Yeah. Those things are actually the things that they enjoy the most because right. you, know, you can sit there carving a spoon and chat to the person next to you. you know? Yes. It's and context. they're not having to stand in front of 150 people and pitch their idea. Yeah. And they get to meet someone and connect and then yes. they've then got their comrade for the rest of the weekend. There you so, go. so Summer Camp was the first big thing we did. And then after that, we just thought, well, actually, this is amazing, but it's very structured. Okay. Uh, because of the amount of people and because where everyone's at and a lot of people come to that either early stage or even pre-idea they're trying to explore you know um, what they want to do with their life mm. almost so we thought actually you know a lot of the people come are a bit further along and also they don't need the structure they just need they just like hanging out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we we then um jack hubbard who spoke at our summer camp um, two years ago uh, is a friend of ours from brighton he runs an agency in in brighton employs about uh, 80 people and he's an, another example of someone we met through this journey. We didn't actually know him before, even though he's based in our town, or was based in our town. Um, but he's another example of someone who's put a cap on his company. So they, they don't grow above 80 people. They've literally set a limit on, on okay. growth. So we connected just because you're like, hey, this, this is what we're about, right? Yeah, yeah. And, but he still wants to grow revenue. So he said, OK, we want to grow revenue per head, but just not people. OK. So again, challenging convention. Indeed. So Jack did his whole talk around bucket list business planning. OK. Which was essentially, you know, don't, I think the way he puts it is don't chase numbers across spreadsheets, make your uh, dreams your business goals and those of your employees too. So they've got a dream ball machine in their office, in their mm -hmm. agency, and every time they, every quarter when they, if they hit their targets, they'll pull out a dream of one of their employees and they'll, they'll pay for that dream to come true. Oh, okay. um, so an amazing company. And so, and then Jack moved out to the Alps and he said, well, you guys come out here, let's get a bunch of people together and we'll do an event out there. So we got 25 founders together. And again, we put that out then. We had like 200 people apply for 25 spaces in wow. like a week. That's pretty and amazing. we were like, okay, we could make this 200 people, but then it would be the same event we were going to put on. So again, us putting in those constraints. Yes. Probably not the most savvy commercial <laughs> thing we ever did. Yeah. But um, it was the right thing to do because, yeah. you know, the event itself was amazing. And it, that curated, you know, that was the other thing we had to do then was curate the group, mm -hmm. which felt a bit... Um, challenging because you've got amazing people to say no to yeah but it made it special because it was that mix of you know different cultures and, and perspectives yeah i was going to ask you about it how, how do you approach something like that how, what criteria did you use to whittle down the the 200 to the, to the 25 um i think just diversity you okay. know really we didn't want it to be an elitist event by any means it was really about a nice mix of men and women different cultures so we had people come from india brazil israel um, the UK, obviously, um, Ireland yeah. represented a dub, in fact, Gar. Okay. Um, so yeah, and I think for us that was the important thing. By putting on these events outside the UK, we don't just want to be bringing people we know from Brighton yep. or the UK there. You know, it's yeah. about growing the community. It's about us learning. You know, yeah. uh, I think we all have our bubbles in, in business. For sure, they're nice bubbles yeah. often, but it's nice to get out of them. So for us, it was us you know, putting ourselves out there and just saying, okay, what's it like to build an incubator in Tel Aviv? Or yeah. what's it like to build a million dollar company in, in Chennai in India? Yeah. Um, and then the India event happened because um, Kumaran, who came to the Alps, said, you guys have to bring this to India. India needs this. And then so this February, we went out to India for uh, well, two weeks of chaos, <laughs> yeah. wow. um, which was incredible. Yeah. So we did the same event, but just in a completely different setting. Yeah ended up taking over a conference of about 500 people for two hours, um, which culminated in our friend Jack rapping on stage <laughs> to a, to a room full works. of blank faces. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah. So that kind of sounds to me like, you know, you're, you're evolving clearly successfully, but there will kind of come a point in time where you'll need to uh, make some decisions as to we can do X number of these events mm -hmm. in any given year, let's say. And... You know, how, how do you see that evolving just in terms of, I won't say put a limit on it, yeah. but like as you successfully have managed the growth, you know, what's the next frontier in that regard for you? Um, I mean, I personally enjoy doing events. They're a lot of hard work, as you know. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of energy behind them because there's, yeah. you know, I think with, with business, it's kind of a long slog. There's very few like, you know, celebrations. You know, you never get to the end like, that's done. You know, yes. it's normally just kind of an ongoing mini win and then the next challenge That's true so i think the thing i like about events is when they're done it's just that amazing feeling of like thank god you know yeah and that was great you know? yeah yeah and you're like we're never going to do that again <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah and then like a couple of months later you're like, oh. uh, maybe <laughs> it's probably like having children i think yeah yeah, um, yeah i hear you 
you know, you forget the bad bits. Yes. Um, and then you get like we get letters and emails and all sorts of stuff sent, and you know, just, that makes that's why we do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a certain amount of passion and energy needed for them to work. So I think that's one thing we've learned is you could say, yeah, we could take summer camp to you know every country in the world and do mm. this, but it wouldn't have our energy behind it. So right. you know there are people who've offered or you know certainly are curious to take some of the things we're doing and, and bringing them overseas. I think it's just a matter of working out a do they have the right intentions, yeah. and b do they have a community that needs it you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a girl who came to India from Australia <coughs> and she's quite active in this world in Sydney and she's keen to do something with us in, in Australia and that ticks boxes for us too right mm. we want to grow the movement so yeah I think there can be collaborations that will help to build the movement but I think personally for us we won't want to do one, more than one summer camp a year you know yeah. maybe a, two or three retreats a year okay um, because we're so part of it, you know, myself yeah. and Carlos and the team aren't there on the outside, you know, well, we are on the outside, but we're also on the inside too, you know, we're, we're particularly with the retreats, you know, we do it as much for us as anyone else. Yeah. And we learn lots from it and we make amazing connections. So, yeah, I think we don't just want to be an events company. Yes. And, and we could potentially spend a lot of time doing yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I suppose that the beauty of the, um, the online piece, it gives you that greater opportunity to reach more people who are passionate about what you're doing, right? Is, is yeah. that how you see it? Yes, but I think the events are so key to it. Yeah. So, you know, part of me wishes we just had an app that we made and we just have to sell that, you know. I know. We have a co-working space. Well, basically the agency space we had, we now yeah. open out to a lot of startups in the community are based in, in our town. And, um, yeah, we have a regular sort of uh, meal once a week, our master munch, which is uh, amazingly named. Um, and yeah, we go around just having a catch up. What's everyone up to? What's, the, okay. what's going on for everyone? And yeah, most of the guys are building, or guys and girls are building tech products, a lot of them. Mm. And they have one thing and they're just trying to move the needle each week, you know, know, whatever that is. So yeah, part of me likes that, the idea of it. But I think if we just did the online bit, we would miss out on something important, which is yeah. the, the physical connection. For so, sure. Um, makes, makes sense. So yeah, one thing we're exploring now is how we can let go of a lot of the face to face sort of connections. So, mm -hmm. you know, allowing people to set up meetups or small communities of purpose in their yes. towns. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Give me a sense from your learning of working with uh, startup type people or people who are coming to you in search of something. Um, the typical, let's say, mistakes that they might make or the, the, the kind of the learning that you see them having. I, I guess I'm just conscious, you know, there's people here tonight and people mm. watching that would have are about to make those mistakes or find themselves locked in that mm -hmm. kind of, Jesus, I can't seem to get out of this trap I'm in. What kind of stuff do you see coming up all the time? Um, it was quite interesting that because I don't know, you can read a blog post, hear someone talk about this stuff, read it in a book and still think, yeah, it's not going to happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm immune. on that basis, feel free to ignore everything I'm about to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because we used to do this with our client, and part of the reason we probably ended up shoving the agency was because we just got fed up sh trying to shoehorn our need to mentor and, and coach people into sure. the clients who didn't necessarily come to us for that. You know, gotcha. we're like, read this book. You know, yeah, it will save yeah. you like fifty grand. Yeah, that's yeah. no, all right. I'm, I'm too bu I'm too busy. Yeah, yeah, I'm too busy wasting fifty grand yeah. or more. Um, I mean, I think one of the key things for me is, yeah, really understanding why you're doing it is a good starting point. You know, so yeah. the vision. You know, for me, there's two things. One is the purpose. So for me, the purpose is about your why. You know, what is really driving this? And then there's the vision in terms of how does that manifest itself in the world? So I think thinking about that, for me, gets away from the product and the detail of the, the thing you're building. And I think that's one of the key things is to not get too tied to that thing because the thing might evolve. So if you're thinking about the change you're making or how you're going to impact someone or how you're going to scratch your own itch if you've got a need that you need to fill or um, you know, a problem you're trying to solve for your business or yourself, then you know that's that's the thing that shouldn't change the business uh, sorry the the product mm. or what you create might evolve over time so that's one thing is just thinking beyond the the product itself because if you're too tied to that then that doesn't work then you don't know where to go with it that's right? true so that's for true. us if we said okay when we started out we want to create workshops and we're going to sell workshops that's our business you know we're, yeah. we're a business school we sell workshops yeah workshops are hard sell mm -hmm. um, you need to be in the right place at the right time with the right money and, and buy into the whole ethos. So that's quite a, a narrow market already. Now we could have 
killed it if we thought that that wasn't going to work. But ultimately, yeah. you start to think, okay, our vision's actually much broader than workshops. It's about you know this ethos that we've got. So I think that's one thing. Um, I think another thing is just just putting it out there. So me being a designer, trying to balance that need for perfection and um, speed, you know, is a a difficult skill. Yeah. And I was always a perfectionist, you know, wanting everything to be perfect. And I think one thing we just see again and again and again, particularly with people trying to build tech businesses, is just it needs to be perfect before we launch. You know, okay. it needs to be perfect before we show anyone. My story needs to be perfect before I tell anyone. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just a safe safety net of you yeah. know, I'm scared. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Which is understandable. Yeah. So I think it's getting comfortable with, you know, getting negative feedback, you know, being yeah. comfortable with failure in inverted commas. Mm. Um, and, you know, we've worked on so many projects or seen so many failures of businesses where they just could have killed the business within a meeting or they could have found that nugget out so early on. Mm. There's a great line from a guy who wrote a book called The Mom Test. So if you're looking to do any customer research, there's a great book called The Mom Test. And Rob Fitzpatrick, who wrote that, says, bad news gets worse the longer you leave it. <laughs> Isn't that true? And it's so true, you know. Yeah. But we're scared, so we leave it, and we delay it, and we delay it, and delay it. So, yeah. you know, getting that bad news on day one rather than day 100 is, is yeah. really important. Um, yeah. But yeah, I could go on, but I think those are the two that come to mind. Yeah, no, valuable, valuable advice. Um, Lawrence, again, I'm conscious of time, and I know a lot of people here will want to ask you questions and things. One year from now, April 2017, um, where do you want Happy Startup School to be? Um, and I'm going back to send in you the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, for me, we try not to think too much about you know twelve months. I think we're trying to think long term, really. Like we're trying to think, you know, what does this look like in ten years' time? Mm. Um, and what decisions do we need to make now to make that happen? You know, I went to one event. Some friends we know. Um, run a conscious business meetup, and they made people write their 500 year business plan. <laughs> 500 years? Yeah, which is oh, bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're not thinking that far ahead. Okay. <laughs> not planning to live forever. No. But I think it is thinking of the legacy, you know, thinking yeah. of what happens beyond your lifetime, which is an interesting way of thinking about business because Isn't you start it? to think about, you know, what decisions do you need to make now to, for a business to last 500 years? If you want to be John Lewis or whatever, you know, yeah. some, some business like that. Um, but yeah, we, we want to have very real kind of immediate targets. So I think the key for us is we want to be able to um, build the business up to a point that we've got enough recurring revenue, which is we see the main growth for the business um, by that point, certainly within the next six months. And the events for us are purely, you know, we need, they need to make money, right? They need to be sustainable, but they don't need to be the main thing that we do. So for them just to be purely a labor of love and, and something that is a community builder, not, you know, that's what we do. And just to be able to reach more people, you know, that's why the internet's such an amazing thing. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, so it's not as a necessity to, to grow the business. It's purely we feel like we've got something to offer. Mm -hmm. um, I think Colm said it, you know, what, you, um, you know what, you, what do you want to serve? Who do you want to serve? So I think for us, we know that this is needed and the people we meet in their town saying, yeah, we need this here. So it's up to us to try and deliver that. Brilliant. My final question for you, Lawrence. If you could give everyone in this room tonight a little bottle of medicine, <laughs> whether you know it's a, a business medicine, a happiness medicine, or something like that. What would be in that bottle? If you will give me a hundred euro, <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. what they're selling, isn't it? If I give away the silver bullet, it's like yeah. it's, it's like it's like the secret. Isn't that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> the secret is um, there is no secret. Actually, one thing that sticks out for me is, um, so we had a guy called A.G. Han, I can't say his name, A.G. Hans Shimizu, I think it's called. That's a great so he's, name. He's a Japanese um, uh, film producer and uh, now speaker and, and an author as well. But he created a movie called Happy the Movie, and he spoke at our summer camp last year. The talk's online if you want to have a look. And... Um, yeah, he was an amazing speaker. He, he spoke so well. But basically, he went on the journey of six years interviewing the world's most happiest people. So the film itself is um, a collection of stories and, and, um, and, uh, and footage of like Okinawa and Japan and, and island, the island of uh, Okinawa where I think they live to the, the highest age of population mm -hmm. live. And they just explore what, does make, what makes people happy. Yeah. What is it that makes people happy? And 
in his talk, he said, we found it, you know, after six years of searching and everyone's sitting up in the room. Like, yeah, here it is. And he, and he just went silent for a minute. And he just brought up this slide and it just says, happy people are kind. Okay. And that was it. He said, happy people are kind. Everywhere we went in the world, everyone we met who were the happiest were the kindest. And they got their happiness from helping other people. And that's one thing that we've tried to do, I think, is just helping people um, without expecting anything back, you know, just by that offer. And yeah, we see it again and again. You can't be happy unless you're, you could be selfishly happy. You know, mm -hmm. we went to see Dalai Lama speak in London last year and he said the same thing. You know, you could be selfishly happy, that's great, but that only gets you so far. Yeah. And true happiness comes from that feeling you get when you're making a difference. So yeah, I think those four words are probably my, my bottled uh, <laughs> secret. Thank you for sharing that secret. Ladies right. and gents, Lawrence McCall.